afternoon. My name is Beth Hicks. I'm the managing director of the Design Center at the Mart in Chicago. Um, and welcome today. Um, our topic today is the soul of design, understanding the neuroscience of beauty, color, and pattern. Uplifting clients is at the heart of what designers do. Not only can it be fulfilling, but a space that makes clients feel good even better can help your business. So today we'll illustrate how understanding the neuroscience of design and color can help elevate mood, inspire creativity, and strengthen your business. Our first guest today is Lori Weitzner, Principal and Creative Director of Lori Weitzner Design. She's internationally known for her contributions to the world of textiles and wall coverings under the brand Weitzner. She has translated her aesthetic into collaborations such as Renat Brands, many of which are at the Design Center, such as Samuel & Son, Perennials, Artistic Tile, among many others. She is the recipient of more than 25 prestigious design awards and often lectures before audiences around the world, engaging the senses and finding inspiration in the world around us, both natural and man-made. Joining Lori is Lisa Stefranz. Lisa has over 25 years of interior design experience, having worked on high-profile, award-winning residential and commercial projects around the country, currently the founder and principal of Stefran's Design. Lisa believes that artistically driven and emotionally connective interiors have the ability to transform one's entire state of being. Lisa is currently working on her first book, The Soul of Design. Welcome, Lori and Lisa. Um, we're so glad to have you here, and we will turn it over uh, to you now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Becky. And thank you guys for tuning in. You never know if people are going to tune in or not, but you're tuning in, so that's great. Um, we're going to open with Lisa has this beautiful, what do you call it, a bell or a... A beautiful bell. They come in all shapes and sizes. They're, they've been with us for a very long time. They're part of, you know, ancient cultures. And it's so a way of cleansing the energy. So if we all just take a moment of pause, I will kind of create a vibrational start. There we Beautiful. go. Beautiful, thank you. Um, so all of you in the audience, we wanted to make it interesting for you. And we were trying to think about how we could and also you know, talk to you about the theme of the day. So we decided we were going to ask each other questions back and forth. And through those questions and through those answers and through the visuals as companions, hopefully um, you guys will walk away with a lot of information, inspiration, and ideas. So I'm going to get the ball rolling first, and I'm going to throw out my first question to Lisa. And um, I think that we'll get started, and we've got some really nice visuals as companions. So just, just as a little bit of background, you all know I'm a product designer, Lisa's an interior designer. I met her many years ago when I was presenting one of my collections at a showroom out in California. And we immediately connected and we immediately started talking about how design, color, texture, interior space can really elevate all of us in our lives and our moods. And Lisa um, immediately started talking about neuroscience and I didn't know what it meant and I was intrigued and she explained it to me and I was fascinated. So um, she's gonna explain a bit about that to you, but my first question is how you even decided to become an interior designer to begin with. Some people have a, it's by chance and some people it's planned from birth. And, and why this, what you talk about the soul through neuroscience and beauty has become such an integral part of it and when that started. Um, thank you. Thank you all for being here also. Um, and also I want to preface by saying that we also have a film that Lori and I created because what we're going to be discussing today is um, it has a lot of layers. And I just we want to invite you also hopefully later to watch our film because you'll get a little bit more in-depth information um, and um, understanding of all the different connections. So I went to, I'll give you kind of a quick synopsis. And um, I went to school and I studied art history, fine art, and architecture. And I have some images on the screen. Um, one of the first things I did that really planted some seeds or really connected for me when I was 17, I backpacked around Europe by myself and I walked into the Sistine Chapel and that was back in the day. I did go into the middle of the floor and get upside down and, and look up at the ceiling. And I was just blown away by the color. And those were all natural recurring colors that Michelangelo used. I mean, they were incredible. Just the how, the intensity of the story. 
And I also have always been very drawn to things that were deeper within us. I think from a very young age, I've, I've always felt there's another uh, layer to how we live as humans and exist. I think it's probably could be called a spirituality. This is an example of Shark Cathedral and the, and the pattern on the floor and the labyrinth. Um, I also gave a TED talk in India. Um, I was already an interior designer by then, but when I went to New York, this was back in the early uh, mid eighties and started my career, I was thought I'd be a painter, but I ended up working at Knoll Design then a very big, large interior design firm and realized I had, I just, I loved it. I went to night school, went to Parsons and School of Visual Arts. And my first project was this um, pretty amazing 60,000 square foot home. And I was um, a very junior designer, but I was really, I just had this amazing, um, I felt like it was a gift given to me where I could coordinate with artisans. The premise or the whole, uh, uh, the, the home was all about artisans. We commissioned everything in the house. Glasswork, cashmere curtains, wood flooring, 80 species of wood, Native American on the continent before Columbus, no stain. Um, and so my evolution as an interior designer happened very organically. It wasn't all figured out. And I, someone believed in me along the way. Now, I also have a picture of my, my children in the upper corner, my sons and my, then my dog, Angel. And I have a picture of the TED Talk I gave in the lower corner. I was diagnosed with cancer 18 years ago. And when you're diagnosed with something and you don't know if you'll make it, it really makes, it made me question what's my purpose. And in the world of interior design, and I've been practicing for a while, there's a lot of, um, you, you spend a lot of money, there's a lot of consumption. And I thought if I didn't make it, what's my legacy? What, can, what am I gonna give back? So I really, and also going through treatments, this is very important. Um, I went into treatment rooms that were very austere and very scary, and they really impacted me. And they changed my perception. I already have a very sensitive perception of environments, but when you're going through cancer treatments, it really hits you hard. Like if you're not comfortable, you're not as receptive to healing. And this actually has been proven in the research I've been doing. So it really put me into a different place that I realized these environments that we put ourselves in have a profound impact on us. And also what's my purpose. So my children are there in the slide because that really redefined my purpose and that there is so much more to spaces that is beneath, even beneath the surface and how we create things. So in a nutshell, there you go. I actually um, think that's when we first met was, yeah. and I was amazed you were so open with me about your cancer thing. And that's how we started talking about how everything around us affects how we feel and who we are. And, and I didn't realize it so much until I was thrown into an environment that's a very fearful environment. And, um, and then you realize that we all maybe don't realize it consciously, but subconsciously we're, we're, we're really trans, we're really affected by things. And then I met you, Laura, and you were working on your collections and your wallpaper collection was just starting and the work with the artisans, it all connected. It was an amazing kismet. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that leads us into my question for you, Laura, is, you know, how did you know that you wanted to be a textile designer and, and how did you know that that was the right path? And what was the background that, that brought you to becoming not just textiles, but also product as well, and just tra your transformational work? Well, the funny thing is, you mentioned that you thought maybe you were going to be a painter, which I didn't know, Lisa, yeah. until this minute. And I wanted to be a painter. And my professor at Syracuse University asked me what I was going to do to make a living. And I said I was going to be a painter. And he said, yes, but what are you going to do to make a living? So I realized that... Um, that wasn't gonna be, I wasn't gonna make a painter. He actually was brutal and he said to me, you're not good enough to make a living as a painter. And even if you were, you wouldn't make a living. So he suggested I switch my major to textile design, which they happened to have at Syracuse, which was also kismet. And I didn't know what it was, but he thought I had a good sense of color and composition and I'd be good for that major. Switch my major and I have to say in all of these years, I've never looked back and I've never regretted it. And what's funny about what's on the screen here are drawings from when I was like nine years old. I used to pretend I was, all I wanted to do was draw fashion ladies. <laughs> and um, I used to pretend I was sick and stay home from school and just do millions of these. And I have tons of these. So this is just a sampling. But if you can look carefully, I thought I was going to be, maybe I could do fashion, but I was really much more focused on the patterns and the colors and even the trim which is funny because I do trim now than I was anything else. Um, and then, uh, you know, textile design wasn't easy when I got out here in America because it's a long time ago and the market was very traditional here. And I, I don't know the age group of people who are, 
who are listening today in the audience, but some of you anyway will know that it was the era of Laura Ashley and Chins from Ralph Lauren. And that's not what I wanted to do. And so I went to Europe and I lived in Italy for a while and I started to work for companies like Missoni and design things and really make a name for myself there. And then at the right time came back to New York. I was lonely to be honest. And then I got the call from Jack Larson, who's pictured there, um, who is one of my biggest mentors uh, in the industry, who taught me so much. And um, that's kind of how it all, all began and happened for me. So, um, so now, you know, I have started my own business, Lisa, um, very early on. I worked for Fieldcrest, which is a betting mill for, for two years. And then I left and started my own business. So I've been doing it a long time in my own way. Um, but you didn't, you first worked for large firms. So tell us about when you decided to make the move to start your own business, because I'm also guessing a lot of people listening are either part of bigger firms, but maybe more over in their own firms. And what's interesting, Lori, about what you just said is, you know, and, um, and I'll segue in, you just, you almost went right, went right into your own business. So you were contracting for other companies though, right? So you were brought in. Yeah. Okay. And you were always able to have, but your own, your own business. So that's me in front of my design studio here in Portola Valley. I'm in Northern California. Um, but yeah, I came from, I was in New York for six years and that client I did that 60,000 square foot house for and numerous other properties. Um, I was bi-coastal for about a year when I moved back and I was thinking, it was actually once again, very organic. I didn't have it all figured out. I came back to California. I wanted to start a family and um, all this, I, people heard about me. And it's interesting, that was before I had a marketing team and a PR team, and I, I had a, a, now I have more of a plan to everything. But then it just, amazing connections started happening. And I think maybe it was the world of, I was working in, but I never, and also the clients, I could never photograph. These are very private clients. I can never say their name, and they will not be published. So I, and I didn't, at the time, I wasn't scared by that. I thought, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? So it was very organic. So I left the big firm in New York, and the client brought me in directly to finish their project. And people just called me and um, they were pretty amazing clients also. When I couldn't use their names, I couldn't publish, but I was so excited that I got to work with artisans and do beautiful projects. I just never looked back. One thing led to the next. Next thing you know, I've got young children and I've got a thriving business and I had a nanny and I had to you know, juggle everything. So I have to say, I, I, um, it, it happened in a way that um, I it was felt organic. very magical. It was organic. It wasn't planned. Like I no, I didn't have my business plan. I didn't have my marketing plan. I didn't have my website. I just, one thing led to the next. The clients were, um, they wanted a lot of privacy and, and discretion, which I still practice to this day. And that's something that I feel like I am somewhat of a, maybe a gatekeeper. I do keep things very private. It's important to people. And I'm very, very respectful of um, people's privacy. But one thing led to the next in terms of, I was always able to work with extraordinary, wonderful artisans and makers around the country and domestically and internationally. So, um, you know, I think some people can get scared about running their own business, but if you deep down are really passionate and you're very truthful and you're very honest and you, 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 you I've always been a connector. I've always been out and about and connecting with people. And I always like to go meet who's doing things. I don't just kind of take it at surface value. So I think starting my own business, that really helped me. And, um, and also, I, that's why I was also asking you, Lori, when we, when we kind of started segwayed in, that um, you started your own business. Did you think about it? Like, did you think, like, I have a plan, I, I'm going to start, or did things just start coming to you? And no, I, I, I never, I, after Field Quest, I didn't want to ever work for anyone else again. Yeah. I <laughs> knew I wanted my own business. I wanted my autonomous design studio. Wow. And I'm laughing because I'm looking at where you work. So I'm in New York City in a totally urban environment. I think there's a picture of my studio coming up. And I know all of you listening are mostly in the Chicago area. And I've been to Lisa's studio, which is like set in a totally green, fragrant woods environment. It wasn't always that way. I have worked out of my house for a long time in the beginning. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, um, I work, I don't know if the, I'm going to try and get the image up of my studio. Um, here it is. It's called the White Box Sanctuary. That's what we call it. It's in the middle of Chelsea, New York City. It's all white, always white, because I'm always working with color. I have wonderful people who work for me, and um, I have never wanted to work full time for a company again. And so I learned a lot. I've learned mistakes 
once and then I fix them. And, you know, it's just like a different way because you don't have the security that you do working for a big company. But on the other hand, what's security anyway, you know, but I get to do what I want. And one of the most beautiful things about this is I started a wall covering, aside from doing all the different projects I do and love, I started a wall covering company called Weitzner 17 years ago, 16 years ago. And it was really- That's when I met you, sorry. <laughs> That's exactly when we met. I launched my first collection. And it was really interesting because I was never gonna start my own like product company, but I felt compelled. I felt the world was ready for something different in wall covering. I had what I thought the world was ready for. It went well, but then all of a sudden, 90% of my time was spent running this company and not doing all the creative work that I love doing, like designing the trim and tile and other stuff. And I then found and met with the owners of Pollock at that uh, about, I think it was like five years into White's New Wall Covering. And we ended up merging the wall covering company and starting a fabric company. And the most beautiful thing about this is that I've been able to keep my autonomous studio and do what I want, but also be part of a bigger company a wonderful company whose operations and customer service are terrific, who run the back office of the Weitzner wall covering and also um, were willing to invest in a textile line. So I now have Weitzner textile and Weitzner wall covering. But all the work is done at my studio with the employees that I've been able to hire. And we're free to do like write my book and whatever else, which, which Pollock loves also because it's all part of the bigger picture. So I have to say, I think I found the secret sauce, at least for me. So I have my, my own company, ups and downs, ebbs and flows, COVID. Oh boy, we could have a whole talk about that. And learning how to ride those waves, the down as well as the up, but also have the security of this larger company that helps me and supports me in the ways that I am not good at, didn't want to do, not interested in doing. And so finding those right alliances has been a savior. And I think part of what my success has been. Mm -hmm. And this is just pictures of my studio and, and showing that everything we do starts with the art, starts with the hand. We draw, we paint, we sketch, we potato print, and these things then evolve and become the textile, the wall covering, the passementary, the tile, what have you. So, um, so that's, that's that. And now we're gonna, we're gonna um, dive in, Lisa, um, because I think the main crux of this is to explain in layman terms what you mean by neuroscience and soul of design and how interior designers and product designers can, can use that and I guess imbue it or immerse it into the work we do. So can you talk about well, that? Well, I think it's also really important looking at your slides and the work you do. Is there something that I think is incredibly important to the essence is there's a truth to process, there's a truth to exploration, and there's a truth to yourself. So Lori, I jumped into my own business, I almost didn't question it, and didn't look back. Lori jumped in, knew that was the right thing for her. We all have to be very truthful with ourselves and quiet down enough to find that truest part of ourselves that I call our soul. And to have it be that that's a very meaningful thing that we approach our life with what we deepest down feel most passionate about and how I the neuroscience um, kind of path for me and soul path was when I first was confronted with life and death and confronted with my legacy my purpose when I had clients who believed in me who wanted to work with things created by hand or had vast collections of things that were just exquisitely made by hand and that was very important how I put that together and as I've evolved I've always traveled I traveled around the country, around the world, and I care deeply about process and artisans and also giving back. And, and the, when you think about life that way and seeing the impact on these places, examples of being in India and see, being at the, at the blessing of a weaving center, that they bless weaving centers. That's incredible that we need more of that in America. We need to bless our, like I rang the bell in the beginning, or bless our office or have a ritual. I have a project now, we're gonna, bless, we're gonna cleanse the house with a, with a process but that we have intention about how we approach things. There's a truthfulness deep inside of our own selves, which I call our soul, that we can bring out to the world and tap into, as human consciousness, tap into the truth of other human beings. What brings every human? There's some little trigger or a link 
that connects them to something. So examples of me traveling the world, learning about process. If I'm going to work with one of Lori's textiles or some of the other beautiful textiles in the world, how are they made? How are they woven? I touch the loom, meet the weavers, see how it's dyed. Um, going to places where I see that the impact of our consumption, how we buy products as designers, as, as creators, as product designers, can impact the school or give children an education. Like that, that, that community can give back and have a greater good to what we specify in the work we do. So as, so the neuroscience, the neurotransmitters, the experience of something that's touched by a hand created with a human being with true intention will affect how we respond to things. And the research I've done on this is really amazing in healthcare and consumption. And it also, I call it the ethical, sustainable, rejuvenative, rejuvenative design consumption. This slide I put in because as designers and as, 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 how, as creators, as running creative businesses, I want us all to be aware that there's a lot of money involved here, like 9 million tons of waste from furniture, uh, almost 600 billion global furniture market, furnishings market, 616 billion home decor market, and 182 billion approximately USA home decor market. That's an amazing amount of consumption and creation and intention that we're putting out into the world. And so this all started to evolve for me when I did my first TED talk and I was talking about ethical, sustainable consumption and the products we specify and that I felt for me in my own personal life and I've seen it affected in my clients' lives and my project lives that if you do things with intention, with the right, if you find out where is it made, how is it made, how does a company deal with waste, does it have a lot of chemicals in it, is it making us sick? We have choices to ask these questions as, as putting, put, and bringing things into people's environments. And it has an impact. It's been proven that things, and that impact will affect how you experience a space. If there's a bad smell, you're gonna go, oh, I feel sick. And then your brain's gonna go, oh, that's a lot of cortisol. I don't feel good in here. So the neuroscience, the soul, the consumption, the products, it's complicated. So watching the film will help, but also that we, we Plant the, I want to plant the seeds of awareness that we should think about everything and the people making it, the people creating it, the entire ripple effect of the decisions we make. And when you're in an environment with intention, it affects how you experience that environment. If someone has cared to ask the questions and bring it to you, it's, it can be very subconscious, but it's been, um, thankfully now we have a lot more healthcare and designs going on where this is proven in those environments, the effect that, you know, beautiful color, furnishings, daylight planes. There's a lot of principles that go into the healthy neuroscience of a space. Wait, also, so can, um, can you do me a favor? And I know I ask you this all the time, but I think it would be good for the audience in the simplest of ways, just to define neuroscience, like with an example of how using it in a space in a certain interior will evoke a certain um, emotion food or yeah so what I'll do is I'll quickly run through and um, we're trying to go through all of our questions um, um, to make it so we have obviously have time for Q&A but I will I'll give you a kind of a brief um, so I think one of my next slides shows some of the color maybe that's I have to see what the sequence is but for example um, you have your the so the neurochemistries are it's our brain it's brains messengers from our body so we'll respond to something and uh, the feel-good neurotransmitter, there's dopamine and there's serotonin, which relates to mood. Um, there's um, oxytocin, the love hormone. I'll use an example and I have a slide later. There's a room I painted for a client that was blue and she was really nervous about having a blue room. But she, I said, just trust me. And also with my projects, I will often tell clients, you know, trust me, but if it doesn't feel right, I'll, I'll paint, I'll change it for you. I'll repaint the wall or I'll bring in something else. I really try to explore with clients and explain to them, I think getting to know them and asking questions, how that, that color may impact them, that pattern, that design. So in that example of the blue bedroom, she told me later that it really transformed her life. She felt so much better in her bedroom. She felt more relaxed. She felt more connected to her partner. That was a color. That was a direct impact from a color to an to a emotional experience. And that was through your neurotransmitters that your brain's chemical messengers to your body to help you decompress. And there are examples like the cathedral effect, designing spaces with really tall ceilings or when people experience a vastness of a great cathedral or a really magnificent space, your mind feels like you can think bigger thoughts. It opens up your mind and it releases more serotonin. 
and it, and it can release more dopamine and more oxytocin. And, and there's examples too, what we've all had as human beings, but how color or an experience can make you feel kind of edgy or energized, which might, yeah. which can become more of the cortisol release. But like a fiery red can get you all fired up but with the right grounding, that cortisol will cause you to um, feel like a call to action or be energized. So the examples are through color, pattern, space, light, how much natural light comes in, how low ceilings are, soft corners versus hard corners. Um, it's also been proven um, in rooms where you may have a lot of books. I think books should still be in rooms that people who are suffering from dementia, if you bring books around them or, or things from their past, their mem it will trigger their memories and it will lower their anxiety. I and never if, heard that. That's actually really interesting. I never yeah, heard it's, it, 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 it's been proven. And so they make sure people who are in, if they're in, in the places that are for people with Alzheimer's or with dementia, that with their own product, with their own elements of their history, they may not remember their history, but they'll feel calmer. Cool. And they won't so feel as anxious. I made you what, talk out of turn of the images. I realized I might have done that. But oh, don't worry. Well, we're just we're supposed to kind of. <laughs> I, just, I just like when you break it down a little bit because I'm. Yeah, also and that's it. why I mean, going from neurotrans, going from neuroscience to soul to beauty to design, yeah. is is a. But I believe if we can all be aware that there is a direct impact of light, color, space, proportion. Um, to how our body chemistry reacts. And I think also with, with the pandemic we've all been living through, people are more sensitive to their environments and they're more aware of, gosh, you know, I really, you focus in on it, go, I really never liked that. And that's just gonna put you in a certain kind of state of mind or mood if you don't really love something in your environment. And if you change it, you go, oh, I really enjoy that. Okay, you just, it just decompresses you. It brings out more of those, nice, you know, those endorphins, you know, the feelings of being, or serotonin, more calm. And thankfully there's a lot more science. There's a whole um, science about neuroaesthetics, which is emerging, which is really exciting that as designers, architects, product designers, creating things for people, we can change the human connection. Even if someone's not aware of it, they can be transformed to feel just better and less anxious. Maybe not get as sick either. That's a bit of a leap, but I believe if we have healthier um, environments that, that uh, release healthier neurotransmitters have less anxiety, will probably have less disease and our bodies, our immune systems will be stronger. And that's something that I'm doing a lot of research on is you know how certain environments can keep, just like eating well, that your environment can also boost your immune system. So that's in a nutshell. <laughs> so Lori, I think, I think that's something you've also done as well though, that what I'm talking about with consumption and product that how you develop your products and determine what goes into your collections and how you connect wellness to the work that you do. And when you're creating something, how do you do that and, and, and still you know, do what you love and create beauty and also run a business? And I think we have similar foundational purpose in what we do, but how do you do that and what, what you create? Yeah, I mean, you know, to, so just to start on the consumption side and then to talk about the other parts, um, we think about that a lot and I get interviewed and asked all the time about what is sustainable in my company. And the thing that's most, I talk about cultural sustainability because one of the things I'm most proud of in my company and in Whitesner especially, but in most other aspects of what we design is we are working with artisan communities around the world doing the most beautiful handmade products by communities that would otherwise not be able to do their craft and make a living at it, but are doing it and making a living at it and keeping and upholding these traditional techniques, but with the collaboration, doing them in modern ways so that they can ultimately be used in the Four Seasons Hotel or Wynn Hotel or Tiffany stores or beautiful high-end residential homes and hopefully getting more into, um, in general, homes. Um, so, I, I think we're up to 56 different artists and communities we're working with for handmade paper panels, for weaving, for printing, silk screening, for um, weaving paper, weaving textile. Um, and we're in Nepal and Indonesia and Japan and, and the Philippines and Thailand, but we're also in America. We're doing it in America as well. It's just finding the right groups to work with in the right ways. So 
I'm very proud of that cultural sustainability, as I call it. And yes, we have some things in the in our collections that are made from recycled polyester or this and that. But what is sustainable, really? There is no black and white to, to that word. It's very gray. So you do what you do the best you can in the way you can. The other thing related to what you say and what you said before about, you know, hand to, to heart. Um, well, these products, when you have them in a space, there's something about them that you feel a connection to because maybe they were made by the, the human hand and they really are beautiful in a space. So I think that that connection, that relationship, I don't know, I'm not educated in neuroscience, but I believe that it, you know, it is a game changer in how people feel in a space. Of course, color, which we'll get to in a minute, is my big thing that I talk about. I wrote a book on color um, called Ode to Color, and it's the 10 essential palettes for living and design. It's published by Harper Collins, and I just want to say that there was this subtitle, the 10 essential palettes of living and design, and I said to them, I don't want to just say the 10 because I think there are infinite. And the publisher was like, no, we need to, we need to just sort of stop at 10. But these 10 color worlds or 10 chapters in this book touch upon maybe similarly to, we can relate them to what you talk about where some colors will, will energize, some color worlds will calm, some color worlds will inspire play and joy and some color worlds will inspire a connection to nature and nurturing and my theory is that everyone is personal and so everyone has to find the right colors for them you as an interior designer and the audience has to figure that out for their client for me I created a color test it's kind of fun and you take it and it just gets the ball rolling on the discussion of what colors I may need in my life right now. And for me, I live in an urban loft in New York City and I always get the color world fragrant woods, which is all these beautiful wood colors and greens. And it's all about nurturing and connection in nature. And it's no doubt because that's what I need the most. So it's an interesting balance that I'd love to turn back to you on when you're designing, you know, how much of it is it what you need versus what you like? Because they don't necessarily are the same. Um, I get a lot of people who get the color world earthly, which is all these fire hot colors and they like them, but they don't know how to use them in a space, but they need them because those are the colors that inspire and ignite passion and following your dream and so forth. And it really gives you that kind of push. Mm -hmm. So we figure it out and interior designers for sure, you guys figure it out. I say, start with lighting a candle and an ex example like that. This is Waterside, what you're looking at. And we picked Waterside as the example instead of, I, we don't have time to show all the color worlds because since COVID, this has been the most popular color world as a result of this test. And I've had over 13,000 people take this test wow. and it makes total sense. And it's because this is a very, and you said it before, Lisa, like the blues grounding, familiar, steadying, comforting. These are the colors people have been longing for in the last month, uh, year. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of a, a little bit about how I work, who I work with and how color and how it all affects how we feel in a space. And so based on what you, you use of the products mm -hmm. that can, you know, you mix it, you, you do your magic with it and we do ours. Um, but it must be hard when you're designing and developing and you fall, you're in love with these you're in love with these colors, but you have to choose which ones make the cut. That must be really hard. It's really like, hard. Because you have to let go of some of your babies. Like, okay, that one's not going to make it. And you have to go through this whole process, right? I mean, you get yeah. to have the... That Look, we're hard. running a business. We have budgets. We have to stick to our budgets. Yeah. And for you guys, like I have interior designers come visit my studio a lot and they get to see color blankets, which I know you've seen where there's millions of colors. And we have to take like, I'm exaggerating with millions, but we have to take like hundreds of colors, cut them up and end up choosing maybe eight to go in the collection ultimately. So all you're seeing are eight. So we try and give you eight of the best, eight of the broadest range, eight that are beautiful, healing, things that you'll be able to use in your spaces. But you know, if we could do more, of course we would. Um, so let's talk about, because I know that it was important that we link this also to good business. And, um, you know, I've been asked a lot about what's my most successful thing I did. And is success is a funny word because it has very different meanings. So I'm going to put it to you, Lisa. How would you answer that question? So I think, um, 
and this also, it's, it's many layers, like seeing all the options and, and the beautiful things that Lori creates and then the options as designers, you know, how do we create things? So my successes on how we, how we curate down, how we make choices, it's, it's multifold. Uh, the slide shows um, I've done uh, some work that's pro bono where I give back. The Ronald McDonald House was one of my, really my greatest successes. I was able to give back and create 56 rooms and create a laundry room for, and I was really very aware of how am I going to change the, the feeling of that space for people who are under great stress with a very sick child. And um, people just came together and they, um, they told me that it, it, they just loved the rooms and, and they really changed them. I had, I did the bigger 56 rooms at the towel building at Ronald McDonald house and um, in collaboration with, um, with Jeffrey D'Souza. And I came in and I was able to find vendors because I really believe in this sustainable um, consumption concept of how we create what we put in the space. We had a very limited budget, but firms came to the table and we were able to use good quality furniture that was well-made with companies that I knew the owners of. And they gave to the, they gave to this project just the goodness out of everyone's heart was incredible success in, for me of what success is. And we could give back a very tight budget and help people's lives and give them less, create an environment where they're less stressed. And that relates directly to your neurochemistry. If you walk in and your child's terribly ill at Stanford Hospital and you come back to the Ronald McDonald House to have a meal and to stay, they give you a place to stay. You can relax, you can, you can uh, have quiet time, you can be comfortable, you can be as inspired as possible by beautiful art and great food, it changes the the family dynamic of how they're gonna how they're healing and the stress they're experiencing. Another project was I gave back. I did work here in my Portola Valley Library, helped with the interiors, and I've had so many people say, "You worked on that? I just love that space." I mean, recycled wood, reclaimed wood, and artisan-made pieces. Um, I've done co commercial work where people don't even know me. They go, oh, you, I think you worked on the design and they come running after me in the space. Hello, hello, can I meet you? What did you do? I just feel different coming to work. Now that's a neuroscience, that's a neurochemical response. Someone comes to work, they feel energized, they feel better, they're not as anxious, maybe they don't have to drink as much coffee. He didn't tell me that exactly, but he said, I just love coming to work. And I'm thinking maybe you just naturally have more energy. You don't feel tired and slumped over. And I brought in color, was true to the brand, you know, the choices we make as designers of how we choose colors and what, kind, what we put into a space. The, 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 the project usually helps reveal itself to you and so does the client if you ask the questions in a way that you really begin to understand what the ethos is. And to have someone run up to me and say, I just feel so good in this space, what did you do? And I said, well, you know, there, there, there are the things I usually employ like good daylight planes and sit stand desks and colors that energize and corners that calm and a place where you can have a cup of tea or coffee or snack. This was pre COVID, but um, now we all have our home environments and office environments where they're very nurturing. And um, I've also a success as a project where someone will walk in. Um, I have a project on the slide has I think 26 foot ceilings that I did with my partner and he created the architecture and creating this space where you feel like there's, you look out into the trees, it's very fragrant woods, green, soothing, seeing the sky. And this has all been proven scientifically as well. Our, our exposure to nature will help, um, you know, help us calm down and be healthier if you walk or just get out in nature and, and you, you take, you, you, you replenish and you recharge yourself. And that's just, that's a, that's a fact. Our bodies respond very well to, to certain colors and light and um, nature. So success to me is measured when someone can say that I don't even know. I feel transformed. I feel different by experiencing this space. Thank you. And that's just this pure gratitude that I didn't ask for, I wasn't even looking for, but that I could affect another human being that I don't know, that I feel like I've had an impact on their life and their well being is what I consider success for me. That I can help people feel more connected and healthier. And um, it just gives me the best, the greatest joy. And so I think, and I, I would think for you, Lori, also that when you're developing, I mean, you must see. When, um, when you're creating things and you're, you're, you see it out there in the world and you see it used, but what, for you, like, what is the word success? It's an well, interesting word, right? It's just words. So, I mean, I, I feel like there are the first and most important in showing the slide is my work with the artisans. I feel like that is a win, win, win for everyone and a great success, both art aesthetically, socially, 
and um, monetarily. Um, this artisan work provides, you know, com communities with a way of life and uh, a living. Then it's providing me and my company with the most beautiful products. And then it's providing you guys with products to work with to put into beautiful interiors. And everyone, everyone benefits. It's full circle. So to me, that's probably what I would call the most successful. And you can see that I, I mean, I work with artisans on everything. We have a jewelry collection I'm working with artisans on. Here's where we strip and, and old maps, recycled maps, and then we weave them and paper back them and they become a wall covering. And yet again, they get used in, in places all over and in, in corporate, um, Google headquarters has all of our woven recycled newspaper. That's like a win, 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 win because the material itself is recycled. So I would, you know, I would say the full circle aspect of it is why, what I'm so proud of and what I would call success. So, um, yeah. I also think you're being authentic. I mean, success. Yes. Monetary success won't bring you joy and happiness if you're not being authentic. Right. You're kind of right. thinking that's what it's supposed to be. But if you can truly be authentic to what you believe in and, and, and how you bring things into a project, it feels... Lisa, I'm glad you brought that up because um, I, again, don't know. I wish I could see all the faces of people who are yeah. tuning in. That's the hard part here. But, <laughs> you. but if there are any young ones starting out, what I'd like to say is that when I got out of school, I was doing these hand painting on silks because that was what I loved. And I had people say, you're never going to sell any designs this way. You're never going to make a living. You've got to paint on gouache. It's a certain like thing we're supposed to do as textile designers, but I wanted to do it a different way. And the other way just felt forced. And honestly, I wasn't very good at it, but I was really good at the other. And I just stuck with it and I found my niche. That doesn't mean we, do, we aren't supposed to compromise because compromise is part of our business every day. But to stay authentic to what you know and don't force yourself to do something that really doesn't feel like it, it can align with you and your spirit. And I, so I'm glad you brought that up. And luckily, luckily, every day I'm grateful um, it's worked out. Not without a lot of bumps in the road, but those bumps led to, you know, a, a ride. So, um, yeah. So, let's, um, we have a few minutes left. So, I know we had a few other questions on the list. And I guess, um, you know, challenges we talked about kind of yeah. running a business. I don't know if you want to touch upon that or you want to jump to uh, well, some other slides. I think import it's important to quickly touch upon, you know, um, how we turn, how we tune into our clients and what's going to bring them the greatest joy. How are we going to create a healthy, what neuroscience and soul is, meaning they'll be in their environment, their home in this case, and they'll experience something that will make them feel like they're their, their best selves or truest selves, tap into their soul. So you have to listen, be patient, uh, be diplomatic. You know, you, you need to be very, it's, it's an unveiling when you get to onto a project and you learn about what somebody really cares about deeply. And as designers, I do a lot of mock-ups. We do renderings, we do scale, we mock it up in the room. In this case, I have a wood screen here. This is very, very personal for the client. It's part of the Oracle language. It's, it's a very personal um, design for them so they can be home and be reminded of something that's very meaningful. And we do renderings and mock-ups. Um, I have a, um, another image of a, I'm sitting on a walnut slab and I threw that in because this is a big chunk of solid walnut. And the entire family came together to pick the raw wood at the, at the wood yard. The grandchildren, the grandparents, the, the clients, that we that will create the mem that's the center of the home that's where all the stories and the life will happen and i can i look at that as creating a space that's going to give them a sense of grounding and being anchored and and, and they're going to have their life evolve there the raising their family and that's going to bring a sense of peace and healthy um it's, it's it goes back to bringing back in the neurotransmitters how do you bring more of that healthy endorphins and serotonin and dopamine into your life and the cortisol is important too in balance. You are energized, but you have this yin and yang. So that's how, how you do that for each individual client. And wait, I have a question. Collective. How did the whole family agree? They just agree? They just they fell in love with the wood together and <laughs> they, 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 they found it raw. And they also, very important as you know, running a design firm, they trusted me. Now, trust, real trust. 
You have to always be honest and you have to really believe it in your truth and yourself. You can't do something because someone else did it and you saw it in a picture or they did that. It needs to be your truth. You need to live true to yourself and your deepest part of yourself, your soul, your goals. And this resonates deeply for me to find these, find these elements in homes where I mock it up or I, do, I create, we do custom, a lot of custom things like with beautiful wood screens that are behind me in my office also, or you work with artisans and amazing artisans who create beautiful lighting and have beautiful crystal or beautiful furniture, pieces of wood and beautiful fabrics that go on them and rugs. But it has to be truthful for you and how you're interpreting that environment to be for the people that have entrusted you with their life and well-being to create it for them. So this whole neuroscience and design and soul is all about truth and being grounded and living um, in a way that's very, um, really it's very holistic. Um, and that's, I think that's important to talk about that process and the challenges because you have to be a very patient person. There's tens, there's millions of op options out there. And how do we filter all that? We filter it by our own exploration to find out what resonates deeply and what really communicates the story you want to create, create for the for your clients, but they also have their own parameters as well. And we have to be really good listeners. I see Beth. Yes, I'm gonna jump in here because we have some great questions that I wanna get to from the audience. Um, so the first one is jumping back, Lisa, to um, kind of some of your opening comments um, about the perception of space and how important that is. Um, you touched a little bit on your cancer journey and, and kind of the healthcare field. Um, and so how, how do you go about designing for the masses, right? Because in the healthcare field, you're not just designing for one family, right? There's um, you're designing not only for the patients that are receiving the care, but also the doctors and nurses that work mm -hmm. there on a daily basis. Um, and everyone's emotional response to things is going to be different. Well, that's um, a really so, so how do you attack that? So that's a really good question. Now, I'm going to use an example. I did not design the Stanford New Hospital, but I I, uh, I have a few clients and um, some of my advisors on my health and well-being and neuroscience are practicing doctors at Stanford. I had a private tour and. Um, that, that hospital was very intentional. And basically they have shown that every room now, there's 10 foot uh, windows with views to the sky. So there's a sense of, there's hope when you look up, there's just, it's a natural human ex emotion. They have, they have many different uh, floors with art. Um, they have healing gardens. Now healing gardens are part of general practice now in commercial large spaces, especially healing environments. And it's been proven there's science. There'll be a chapter in my book on that about the science of neuroscience and, and, and soul of healing. So people can walk through the healing gardens. There'll be some aromatherapy in there. There'll be places to sit and pause. There'll be art. There's uh, non-religious you know, non, uh, uh, chapels and religious chapels. Um, there's places to have a cup of tea and gather, but also kind of be in a corner. The central atrium, and I have it in some of my other talks, there's a big, beautiful cast glass in the atrium. And it just, it takes your mind off things. It's more abstract. So in terms of how it, there, thankfully there's science behind how you create these larger environments. I think they're doing it more in hospitality now as well, um, that every human on some level will respond to and have a neuro a chemical or neurotransmitter reaction to of being calmer. And they've even shown some of these rooms with, with large windows, less pain, pain medicine, more receptive to healing with the right, with certain colors. Now color is very personal, but they're, they're, Thankfully, there are enough studies now to show some colors will just calm us down. So you probably wouldn't put a bright red wall in, a, in an intensive care room. And the doctors also, they all got their, they all these beautiful new offices. And I've spoken to some of the doctors. They go in and they have views to outside. They have motorized shades. So they can block the glare. They can, um, they have a plant or they have something living. So these things have anchored, anchored them. So it's a really great um, was test uh, study that's working very well and a lot of hospitals are adopting this all around the country as well as you know more commercial spaces daylight planes plants color uh materials that have some depth and pattern to them they're really showing that people are um they're healing faster and the families maybe are not as agitated or scared they're a little more calm because there's environments that help them feel nurtured and this is something that um thankfully we're evolving more and more into 
So that's taking it universal. Um, and this is a question for either of you. Now, once you, you go down to more of the residential and the more personal, mm -hmm. the um, a, a few more universal things like soft corners was talked about, but then specifically a blue bedroom. You know, how, how does the dialogue work one-on-one -on -one with your clients to determine what is that right color that evokes those emotions? Um, Lori, you want to start with that? Well, you know, just just to talk about color a little bit, and then Lisa, you can address it like within the space. One of the big beefs I've had with magazines and trend forecasters and Pantone color, you know, Sherwin Williams color of the year is that um, color is very personal and it shouldn't be trend that makes you determine whether your wall is purple or green. Mm -hmm. It should be how it affects you. And one of the goals of this color test in the book is to give put the power in the people and allow them to understand that color is a tool like anything else for them to use in a way that makes sense for them. I think the role and job of the interior designer is to help them figure out how and what that is. But it is really the, the person who's going to live in that space to, to understand how they feel with that color or texture or pattern around them. So, you know, it could be that um, they love red but red makes them anxious. It's not a good color for them. It could be that they love a certain type of green, but it's actually a different type or a different shade of green might be better because it can be energizing and calming at the same time. So this is where the interior designer has to come into play and get more nuanced with it. But my whole message, and it's intuitive, it's not science, mm -hmm. it's, it's different to, to Lisa's message, is it's intuitive and it's how you feel. You have to check in with yourself around what those colors are. So what what um, I think is really interesting is that people are starting to do that. And with these 13,000 people who have taken this test and the analytics, it also shows you how it changes. So pre-COVID, we had very different color worlds being most popular. Post-COVID, different ones. What is that telling us? And also, how does that challenge the interior designer to create spaces that can easily change? You know, also that brings up a good point because um, I've had some clients for multi-generations, but as designers, as interior designers, we're, we're, we're filters in a sense, we're curators. So to really listen, and sometimes I have clients say, I, have, I don't even know where to start. I don't know what to do. So I, I start to listen and I say, well, there are places you like to travel or there's certain clothes you like, are there certain like restaurants you love? Just try to get more information about the places where they love and they feel really happy. And then I start to bring things in and try different things and see what the reaction is. It's almost like if you were trying on clothes, I'll say, well, try this pillow or this throw. Or, and it's nice when the, when the, when the family's involved, everyone's going to live in the house, sometimes the children also. But, um, and um, it, it evolves and we become curators in a sense and we bring them more things. And often I will say, let's try it and see. But I have seen the direct impact of, you know, someone who's just anxious or they're not getting along as well. And if we have the right environment, everyone feels a little calmer. There's, uh, they can, they can talk better, but, it, and I, now I, um, I say, if you're not sure what color it is that you're going to respond to, I will have them, you know, look at the color, do the color test. And also I'll just bring lots of things and say, just sit with it, see how it feels. And I'll try different things. So, um, but as a designer, we need to be very good listeners and we need to learn how to filter and curate. You can't throw it all in a room. You just can't. And I'll say that's, if we're not sure, let's be a little calmer. We're going to add splashes. If you're just, and if I'm not sure, I'll mock it up for you and you'll try and live with it and just see. So, you know, that's the approach I take. I'm very inclusive. I want them to feel safe and comfortable. So I may go a little further to do the samples and the mock-ups and get big wing samples. I will often go to the showrooms for my favorite things and bring a big wing sample over, lay it out and say, you know, think about it for the weekend. Don't feel pressured. See if you enjoy it. And there's also back to trust. Trust is so important that they'll trust. And I say, you know, it, it's worked, and, um, but I care deeply that it works for you. So there's a process to that. So what happens when you guys have a client or a couple per se who, who start with this color test um, mm -hmm. and are complete opposite color fields? I'm sure that's happened more than once. Um, so how do you guys attack that? Let me start by saying the color test is that um, I, I have on my list of to-do things, which is a long list, to do a second follow-up where it gets individual by room. So this is a general color test. Um, to give you a general direction of where you're at and what you may need. It's not specific to each room. So for one thing, 
there can be different spaces. Each person in a home or should have their own area anyway. I'm sure, Lisa, you would agree with that. Oh, absolutely. And they could create that. And then also, there's so many different color worlds can work together. It just depends in what way you do it. And that's, again, where the interior designer comes into play. But it's really important to know what those diverse results are so they can work with it. Because if you just do it in, in a way that suits one, those people might not get along forever. That's right? a really good point because, you know, you need to be, in, and it's very important you really see both all the perspective of who's enjoying, who's going to be in this environment. It's harder in commercial work, but I've done amazing teams. I've done enough work with big commercial projects where if you ask the questions of the collective whole, you can usually get really, it, it's pretty awesome. With couples or with, with, with partnerships and with families and homes, Everyone needs their own space and you can't have favorite like, well, you know, you got to be equal. And also there's, you try different things and you sometimes find a compromise where they, but you both understand that you, they've made a compromise together, but it's a beautiful one, but you don't want to ever feel like you didn't, you don't want to go in as a designer and you don't want one of the, them to say, we didn't really listen to me. And you also want to know who, who, who there might be one, one part of the partnership of the, of the client who they trust, they say, well, they're going to really be in charge. I really don't know what I like. And then all of a sudden they go, well, I didn't like that. I go, well, I thought you said they were in charge. And they go, well, okay, you have to be a diplomat too. You have to come in and go, well, I know you say you don't really know, but I think if I could open up in a very subtle way, you, I never hit people over the head with this. I'm very subtle. I said, well, how do you feel about it? Even if you're not sure how you feel about it, if you've never thought about it before, maybe I can ask certain questions to ask you what is the emotional reaction the emotional feeling to something which is directly related to your biochemistry by the way so I care deeply that I'm not going to make them agitated and unhealthy they're going to the end when I'm gone long gone and they may run into me somewhere they go oh my god you know that was amazing you were right so that, I think that interior designers are also therapists oh yeah you yes, need to be a sure. diplomat you need to be a listener <laughs> and you can't be judgmental you need to be you know once you set the ground rules, right, of what the terms are, how you conduct business together, and you need to also stand your ground as an interior designer. Don't force your idea, but gently, they have to trust you and you have to come in and, you know, there have to be certain business ground rules too. Great, and I think we have time for one more question, and this is directed um, towards Lori, um, is, is how do you choose what colors your fabrics and as you're developing a collection? Are you looking for kind of voids in your overall collection? Are you looking for, um, to build out certain colors, or, or how, do you, how do you go through that process? I love that question, and I will tell you, it's the hardest thing we have to do here in the studio, because you know, there's just so many beautiful colors that come out and because of budget, as I said before, we just can't do them all. So part of it is intuitive. Part of it is um, knowing what's what sells well. Um, in all the years I've been doing this, which is a long time, the neutrals are always the best sellers, no matter what. So we always wanna make sure we have some of those neutrals, but I try and do different neutrals. And then we always want to um, expand the palette. So White Snare has a particular palette, um, but we're always trying to expand it. And for example, it was just last year that I didn't, I realized I need more greens. And when I say greens, I mean all kinds of greens in our collection. We just don't have enough. And then I was thinking about blue, which is a hard color for me personally. We need to expand that and we need to do it in a way that it feels White Snare, that it makes sense. So. There's a little bit, it's like cooking, um, where you start with a recipe, but then you add a little of this, and then you add a little of that, and now it needs a little more sweet, a little more salt, and then eventually you have your 20 colors, and then the president says, we need to make it eight. <laughs> and, and then, you know, and then you just force yourself to be, to do it, and, and we do get input from a business side, we do get input from our national sales manager and our wonderful reps at times. So it's a little of everything. That's, thank you for that question. Yeah. Not easy. Well, <laughs> well thank you ladies so much. Uh, Lisa and Lori, it was a pleasure having you uh, here today with us. Um, and everyone, thank you so much for joining us and have a great day. Thank, thank you everybody. You. We're so, so glad much. you're out there.